Well, good afternoon or evening in Ireland. Um, my name is Richard Rook. Uh, it's actually Richard Tucker Rook. Uh, Tucker is the name of my family back in Ireland who emigrated in 1883. Um, I am a Took Emigration Fund descendant, um, as Jane Kennedy is fond of saying, a proud Took Emigration Fund descendant. Um, and I'd like to tell you a little bit today about the, uh, what the Tucker family encountered when they, when they came to the United States, came to the New World in 1883. Um, I know we're on a time limit, so uh, you might see me looking down at my watch occasionally, uh, being, and I apologize for that, uh, being Irish American, I can talk forever, uh, and I certainly don't wanna do that. And I want to thank um, everybody who was involved in putting this program together. Uh, and thank you for inviting me, and it's a real honor. Um, as I said, my name is Richard Tucker Rook. I'm, I'm speaking to you today from Massachusetts. Um, I'm actually speaking only a few miles from where uh, the Tuckers wound up settling 130 miles ago, 130 years ago. Um, I am the great grandson of John Tucker and Catherine Murray. Uh, from Tip in the Belmullet Peninsula. And they emigrated as part of the Took program in April of 1883, uh, arriving in Boston in May of 1883. But they didn't stay in Boston. They had been promised work at a cotton mill in Grosvenordale, Connecticut. Uh, they were textile workers my and railroad workers. And I'll explain some of that. My Aunt Anna, my mother's sister, um, who was probably the only source of family information that I could believe, uh, used to joke that uh, we must be the only Irish American family that never produced a priest, a politician, or a policeman. The three Ps of Irish American assimilation. We did produce a lot of railroad workers and textile workers. Uh, just about all of the textile, all, all of the Tucker family male and female, all 13 of them that survived infancy worked in the textile mills. And all of their children, the next generation, worked in the textile mills. So I, I wanna give you some idea of what they, what they experienced. Uh, this would be a big change for them. Back in uh, Belmullet, obviously they were farmers, tenant farmers, and now here they are in New England working on in mills with, with heavy equipment. Uh, because John Tucker was a seasonal agricultural worker back in the old country and therefore spoke fluent English and two of his working age sons spoke fluent English, uh, we wound up here instead of going to Canada as many of the two program participants did who didn't speak English. So they wound up at the Grosvenor Dale Mill to put this into some context. Uh, Grosvenor Dale is about 60 miles, 100 kilometers from Boston. Okay, all of this is happening within a very, even though it's over several states, uh, it's happening over a very small geographic radius. For a textile worker in, in 1883, the Grosvenordale mills were about as good as it gets. Uh, these, this was a modern mill, uh, very progressive family. They were Quakers which is probably as, as was Mr. Took. So that was probably the connection that resulted in my family coming here. But it was a state of the art facility. It was uh, well ventilated. The mill owners made sure that there was adequate housing, uh, stores, uh, every, the pay was good, everything, everything was good. Uh, the luck of the Irish was with them. But unfortunately it didn't last very long because in 1885, the person who arranged all of this, a man named Lucius Briggs, had to retire from the mill operation for health reasons. Uh, and the successors who replaced him were not quite as enlightened as he, and many of the employees just left. In my case, they left to work at the silk mills in New Jersey. Um, that was going from the best of the textile world to the, to the lowest rung on the textile ladder. Uh, these were hell holes, these were, these were sweatshops, these were awful working conditions. 
to put this into some historical context, 1883 was moving into just about the heyday of the American Industrial Revolution, at least in Southern New England. And Southern New England was becoming the textile capital of the world. Immigrant labor was responsible for it. They were coming in from Ireland, from Poland, from Italy, from everywhere. Uh, they were welcomed, they were appreciated, and, and things were pretty good. But it didn't last very long because the cotton mills literally and figuratively went south, okay? The, the cost of doing business was lower in the south. The, the, the rail lines were, were complete. And by say 1910, um, the textile industry, which employed half of the state of Rhode Island uh, when, when my family was here, uh, was pretty much dead. So they turned to railroad work, which I will get into a little bit longer, uh, a little bit later. So they had it pretty well when they came here, they went to the, the, uh, the awful mills in, in New Jersey. They stayed there for seven years, uh, and then they wound up back in, we're very close to where I am right now in Northern Rhode Island and Southern Massachusetts. They paid a very heavy price for the work in the textile mills um, as I'll get into. And uh, th the price they paid was with their help. Uh, as I said, these were very poorly ventilated. They, it was oppressive heat, awful working conditions. You were breathing toxins all day long. Almost nobody in the Tucker family lived past the age of 35. They all died of respiratory, uh, they all died of respiratory diseases, or in some cases, railroad accidents, railway accidents. Every single cause of death for 30 years of a Tucker who lived past infancy was either respiratory disease or a railroad accident. And since their spouses were also textile workers, they weren't producing, and dying young, they weren't producing many children. Uh, so my family, every generation, the Tucker family in New England seemed to get smaller, not bigger, okay? Um, at least one good thing came out of this, one thing that I'm, I'm very proud of. In about 1910, 1911, the labor movement really started taking hold in Southern New England. Uh, immigrant textile, textile workers were getting sick of the working conditions. There was a, at least in the United States, famous strike known as the Bread and Roses strike in, in Northern uh, Massachusetts, where 25,000 immigrant workers just walked off the job to, to protest trying to get better working conditions. Uh, they were beaten, they were jailed, they were fired, but the genie was out of the bottle and the mills in which my family worked also picked up the ball and did sympathy strikes. So my great grandfather's three oldest children all became heavily involved in the labor movement. They went to jail, they were beaten, they were fired but it produced some long-term federal legislation that improved the working condition of the immigrants, uh, especially in Rhode Island, especially textile workers. Now, I know that many of the Tupan immigrants had hard lives. They, they, many of them went to the coal mines in Pennsylvania, the steel mills. Uh, they had to endure Montana and, and uh, Minnesota winters if they were ranchers. Uh, but the textile workers, I, I think, suffered greatly and died young as a result of what they did. So my family gradually moved from textile work to into the railroad work, not laying track because the road, the uh, track had already been laid, but they worked as conductors, as brakemen, as station masters, the whole thing. So that's what we did. We were textile workers and labor workers. But there was one other thing that they did that I'm also very proud of. Uh, around this time, and this surprised me greatly when I learned about it, the Irish Americans were not in Southern New England, were not discriminated against in 1883. They were welcomed. They were, they were the backbone of the Industrial Revolution. But as the Industrial Revolution here wore down, 
and the mills were struggling because they were moving south and the mill owners had made a lot of money and didn't really need or appreciate the immigrant labor as much as they did, there was a resurgence of anti-immigrant sentiment and anti-immigrant discrimination. There's no other way to say it. So my, again, it was John Tucker and his three children, uh, they became very, very involved in the cause of Irish independence. From 1916 until 1922, they were raising money and doing whatever they could to support what was going on in Ireland. And this was partly, I think, as a result of the nativist, xenophobic, uh, anti-immigrant sentiment that was taking over between 1910 and 1925. The Ku Klux Klan was shockingly powerful in Massachusetts and Rhode Island during that time period. They elected governors, they elected uh, town officials, town leaders, and they were virulently anti-Catholic, anti a lot of things, but anti-Catholic. And so what happened is the, um, the Irish Americans started to think of themselves more in terms of their Irish heritage. And they became more supportive of what was going on in Ireland. One of my great uncles, um, John Tucker's son, raised a lot, he owned a bar, which is a good venue to raise money and in Rhode Island make political connections. Uh, he raised a lot of money uh, and met when uh, Eamon de Valera came over to Rhode Island in 1919 to raise money for the Irish independence cause. My great uncle was there to meet him with a very large check. So I'm very proud that they stood for something. They, they got involved in the labor movement. They got involved in the, in the fight for Irish independence. But it's surprising to me that this even happened. Being ignorant of history, I thought the days of no Irish need apply in, in New England ended somewhere around 1860. Uh, actually, it was still going strong into 1920. Um, and it, it was really terrible. And, and it was born in some degree um, from the awful conditions that the textile workers had. There's a, there's a story I tell. The first job that my seven-year-old grandfather had in a textile mill was called a ratter. He was a ratter, okay? And what that meant was th this was a mill, the rats got caught in the looms. They got caught in the, in the industrial process. The job of the ratter was to reach in and pull the rat out of the loom. Now they didn't stop the loom because that would lose precious production time. They slowed it down, okay? So the seven-year-old kid had to reach in, grab a rat, which might not even be dead, okay? Pull it out and if he guessed wrong, he was going to lose a hand because his hand would have been drawn right into the uh, moving parts of the machine. So these were the conditions that textile workers had to, had to put up with. Uh, and it didn't get a whole lot better. So I don't think it was a great loss that the textile industry moved south, but it, it certainly exacted a price in terms of uh, help and early deaths. My own mother, um, I, this is when you realize that how close you are to anti-immigrant sentiment. My own mother had to drop out of, in 1920, had to drop out of school uh, for one year, maybe two years, to help support her family because there was such a resurgence of anti-Irish sentiment and other ethnic groups, it wasn't just the Irish, there was such a resurgence of nativist sentiment that the working age males in her household couldn't get work. So she had to drop out of school to help support the family. So when I think this was all happening you know, years and years ago, and it was, I also think that I'm one generation removed from no Irish need apply. My mother was affected by anti-Irish anti-immigrant 
anti-everything sentiment. So it makes me very, very grateful for the sacrifices they made. It makes me not complain so much when my car won't start in the morning because I think of what they had to go through so that I could even have a car. Uh, and, and I think when you look at the whole story in historical context, uh, it, it's quite a remarkable story. And so we owe a great debt. I owe a great debt personally to the wonderful people that I have met since I discovered the story of the Took assisted immigration program. The relatives I didn't know I had, uh, mostly in Ireland, uh, the people like the people who are putting this program together, who are keeping the story alive and, and making sure that we appreciate our, our heritage. But it was, it certainly was not an easy heritage. And, and uh, as I said, I'm, I'm very, very grateful for the opportunity to tell the story. I hope my children and grandchildren will, will keep the, the story going. Um, I'm trying to think of whether or not there's anything else that I wanted to add to this. Um, I, I, no, I, I, guess, I, I guess what I'm going to close by saying is that it was, I, I don't know, sometimes I wake up in the middle of the night and I, and I say, if they had to do it all over again, would they have come here? They were, they were leaving terrible conditions in Ireland, but they were coming at least my family coming to terrible conditions in the United States. Now they persevered and, and uh, I'm glad for it obviously, but it's um, a story unfortunately that seems to be repeating itself in the United States. The Irish have assimilated, other ethnic groups have assimilated, but now there's other groups coming into the country that are feeling, trying to come into the country that I think are feeling some of the same anti-immigrant sentiment that so many of us went through. So I, I'm grateful for what I have. I'm grateful for what I've experienced. And I'll close by saying thank you again to everybody who put this together. And I'm honored to be part of it. Thank you.